had an actual encounter with the Lord, and I, I was willing to do whatever he wanted me to do until I found out it wasn't him wanting me to do it, praise the Lord. Yeah. But nevertheless, Christianity isn't complicated. It really isn't. The more you learn about the reality of Christianity, the more, yes. the more you realize how uncomplicated it is. Yeah, Amen? And because a child can come to the Lord. Yes. In fact, he says unless we come as a child, we don't really get to where it is where he's trying to get us to. Amen? And so it's not complicated. It's not about rules. It's an it's a invitation, amen, to have a relationship with God amen. that he wants, that he wants us to experience and that he wants to experience, amen? So God's power isn't something that he sends to us from off in space somewhere, you know, a billion light years beyond the planets that we can see. That's not the truth. The truth is miracles are not like packages from Amazon, amen? amen. They come and they're totally disconnected from whoever sent it, right? It's just the, you get the package, right? Well, the power of God can't be separated from his presence. That's the difference, amen? If you stand next to a fire, you're going to feel warmth, right? Amen? If you jump into a pool, you're going to get wet, right? So it's the same way with God. If you get close to the Lord, his power is present, Amen? So the power is in the presence. And if you get close to God, and the potential for the supernatural then is everywhere around you. Yes. I mean, we felt it here this morning. Yes. You know, and I'm not just about feelings. I'm not, but there's nothing wrong with feelings. He gave them to us, right? So if you get close to God, when we're worshiping and praising and we're, we're focused, amen, on the Lord, the atmosphere changes. You just know that there's something going on here that isn't normal. Right. Normal in the sense that when I go through my everyday life, I'm just kind of, right. you know, bopping along thinking, okay, well, yes, the Lord is with me, but I got to do this and I got to get this thing done and I got to get that thing done. And we, you know, yeah. life is busy. It's complicated. We got families. We got this place to be and that place to be. And it's easy sometimes to kind of just put God on the back burner. But if we're conscious of him, he's here. He's present. Amen. He's with us. He's all around us. Amen. So it's the manifest presence of Jesus that radiates from the Father. Amen. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 through 3. So God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Praise the Lord. So God's presence, the presence that, that rests on us when we make room for him. In other words, when we focus on him, it isn't that he's not always with us. It's just only when we focus on him that we are aware of that. And when we're aware of his presence and when we're conscious of that presence, the power is there. Yes. It has to be because that's God. It's just who God is. Amen. And so when we talk about being supernatural, and we are supernatural. Yes. I love Tammy's got it on her phone every time she yes. sends a text message and I'm supernatural. Well, we all are. Yes. That's a fact. We're, yes. we're children of God. Now, how can you not be supernatural? God's supernatural. And it's in our genetic, as a, as a born-again believer, as a child of God, to be supernatural. So when we talk about that, supernatural, it's easy to think that, that being supernatural is us walking around with special powers. You know? Like, wherever we go. And it's, it's like, you know, staring mysteriously at people before we predict the results of some situation or some incident. You know, it's like, yeah. mm, Sally. <laughs> um, praise the Lord. We are just naturally supernatural. It doesn't mean we don't flow in the gifts. It doesn't mean that we don't do things. It's just that we don't have to be, make it about us. It's like, you know, just like uh, Jody's saying, it isn't about us. No. It's just we can't help ourselves. Right? right? I mean, and, and what the enemy does is what he's tried to do to you and it does to all of us is 
you know, you're going to just make this about you. You're, you know, you're, you're all about you. you know? No, it's God that's doing this. And if we don't have the courage to step out and say it and risk somebody thinking that maybe I'm egotistical or I'm, you know, then it won't get done. So the people that want to talk about you, the people that want to think evil of you are going to think that way. You know, so who cares? Let's just be what we are. Let's just do what we do naturally. Amen. And the truth is, Moses understood what really set people apart as believers. Amen. When he said, show me your glory, he also said, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us up from here. Amen. Because what else is going to distinguish us from everybody else? It isn't the miracle. Hey, we've all known phonies. We've known people who, you know, I mean, you can see, you read about them even in the Bible, Balaam and others, who, who tried to operate in the gifts and so on and so forth. That, that didn't distinguish them as being a child of God. Amen. It was the presence of God that made the difference. Amen. And so, to me, that's huge. And that's what God was showing me. When I was asking about my responsibility, what should I do? How am I to do this? Should I be out here doing this and doing that and the other? Yeah, I mean, if, it's, if, if the occasion arises, if there's an opportunity for that and, the, and you're led by the Spirit to do it, then by all means. But I don't have to be doing that constantly, amen, to prove anything to anybody. Amen? Moses knew that Israel could have, they, they could have had the best military. They could have had the best economy. The best of everything. But all of that would have been worthless if they didn't have God's presence. And that's what sets Christians apart. What sets Christians apart isn't, uh, we're separated from the non-Christians. It isn't how we dress. It isn't our hairstyles. Amen. It isn't that we're funnier than they are or that we have a higher IQ than they have. Amen. It isn't that we we have some weird behaviors that separate us from. We may have weird behaviors, but I had weird behaviors before I was a Christian. Yeah. They just carried over. I mean, yeah. some of them are just part of your personality. You know what I mean? You can't escape it. It's who you are. But what really distinguishes us is that we are a people of God's presence. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. It's never been about what we can do. Mm-hmm. It's about who we are with. Oh, man, I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Praise the Lord. And David is a great example of this. His life was full of God's power. God raised him from a shepherd boy to the greatest king that Israel had ever known. And will ever know until Jesus reigns on earth again. Amen. And David was just a type of Christ as far as being the king. He had military victories. He killed Goliath with a rock. He defeated all, you can read it, all of Israel's enemies. And yet, when you read the Psalms, you see what David was pursuing all of his life. And it wasn't military strength for the sake of military strength. It wasn't supernatural power for its own sake. It was God's presence. Now let's read some Psalms here just to validate this. Psalms 27 Verses 4 and 5. Psalms 27, verses 4 and 5. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Praise God. Psalms 139, verses 7 through 10. Thank you, Jesus. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand hold me. Praise the Lord. Psalms 23, verse 4.
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Praise the Lord. Yes. You know, and I'm not to be morbid, but uh, Sally and I were talking about, and look, there's nothing, it's not like we're predicting anything here. But, you know, you get to a place where you've got to make arrangements, you've got to do things, so you don't want everybody else having to do it later. So we were talking about, after we die, when we leave this thing, uh, how, how do we want to do this, you know? And, and we were talking, we, we both kind of came to the conclusion that we'd just be cremated. You know, I mean, simple, less expensive, amen, and that's it. Well, the reason I think that way is because the scriptures we just read, you know, some people think, well, well, if there's no body, how's he going to resurrect you? Give me a break. Yeah. <laughs> the people that have been dead for, you know, 2,000 years, there's nothing there. Yeah. You're not going to find anything. I mean, you go dig it up and there's nothing there. He said, if I make my bed in hell, if I were into the sea, to the bottom of the sea, you're, you're with me. If I'm dust, if this is dust, he's still with me. Because it's not, this is not me. This is just the thing that gets me legal to be on this planet, to have the spirit in me. Amen. So I'm just saying, not that anybody else here is thinking about those things, and I'm not dwelling on it. I'm just saying it is something you have to deal with at some point, and I don't want anybody else to have to make those decisions and think, wow, did I, is that what he wanted or isn't that what he wanted or whatever. No, I'm not worried about it one way or another. I'm just, when I leave this, I'm with the Lord. I mean, so praise the Lord. When David sinned, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed, you would think that would be a time that he would have been running from God. He would have been looking for a way out, some way, an excuse, you know, some covering, something. And instead of that, he ran to God. Praise the Lord. David had some insight into grace. He knew the truth about God's true identity, what God was really like, what it was like at his core. Amen. And, and, and because of that, when he screwed up and he did big time, multiple times over and over, like most of us, instead of running and hiding, he ran to God because he knew God was like the prodigal son's father. He knew God was waiting for him to come back to him if he just would. Amen. And so look, let's look at this. Psalms 51 verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That was David's response to his own rebellion, his own sin, his own rejection, amen, of, of the principles that God had given him. It wasn't, you know, you know, don't kill me. No, it was just, don't leave me. Don't ever leave me. And don't take your spirit from me. Praise the Lord. Psalms 42, verses 1 and 2. And again, David is using this analogy for himself, about himself. And he says, just like the deer, the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Yeah. Now that... As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O Lord. You know, it's easy for us here in an Anglo, you know, American kind of way of looking at life. But this isn't the image of Bambi, you know, prancing around uh, near a forest stream somewhere. Some pristine little, you know, vision, you know, of a deer just wandering around in the woods and comes upon a stream and has a drink. This is an image from the Middle East from the scorching heat of that part of the country that David was familiar with. It's a deer panting for water. Its throat is burning for the one thing that will maintain its life. Now think about Moses again. He was given the law. He led Israel through the Red Sea. He saw manna fall from heaven, but he knew the key was God's presence. Amen? Amen. And that's why he said, if you're not going with us, I'm not going. Right. I mean, I know what you've done. Amen. David 
the greatest king of Israel. Greatest one they ever had. He's battle scarred. He's hardened by the life of war because his life was filled with warfare. He wept and cried out for the presence of God. The power is in the presence. And it's not just what we want and need. It's what God wants. That hunger in us comes from God. Unless his spirit draws us, nobody comes to God. From Genesis to Revelation, the scripture tells us that God's desire isn't just that we move in the supernatural. It isn't just that we have power. Those are things that he wants us to experience, but that isn't really what his focus is. What his focus is, is that we live a life of intimacy with him. And that's what David understood. From Adam and Eve in creation. I mean, they were able to walk with God. The scripture says in the cool of the day, they had intimacy with God. They had closeness. They had relationship. Amen. Amen. And the greatest consequence of their sin was that they separated themselves from God. They hid. Yeah. Amen. And that's why the first question God ever had to ask, check it out, was, where are you, Adam? Mm-hmm. And the truth is, humanity's been hiding from God's presence ever since. Yeah. Even, even as Christians many times. Because we fail. This is what grace is all about, guys. It's God's way of saying, I don't care how bad you screwed up. You can't screw this up enough for me to not love you and not want to have relationship with you. It's like a parent and a child. It's like a grandparent and and a grandchild. They do stupid stuff. They're kids. They're growing up. They're trying to figure things out. They've got their own experiences that they have to deal with. And yet, how do we feel about it? We just want them, just come, let me hug you. Let me, let, let me tell you how much I love you, yes. that it's okay. Yes. Everybody's screwed up. You're not unique. You're all right. It's okay. I still love you. You're, yeah. you're my child. Amen? Yeah. And that's God. That's the way God deals yeah. with us. And so the Bible is a story of God seeking to draw people to him. Yeah. Amen. It's not about us doing everything right and getting all the rules together. The Bible is about God trying to tell us how much he loves us and how much he wants us to be with him. Yes. Amen? The, the very heart of, of, of Israel's calling was that they would be a people of God's own possession. Mm-hmm. That, they, that he would be their children, or they would be his children, I should say. Amen? That he would live among them. Yep. Praise the Lord. Remember Moses' words, he said, what else is going to distinguish us if it isn't your presence? Without that presence, we're no different than anybody else. Right? Right? We're all flawed. We're all screwed up. We're all messed up. We all make mistakes. It's the presence of God that distinguishes us from the people out here in the world. In practice, what that meant was that God commanded Israel to make a home for it. He said, I want you to be mine. Mm -hmm. And so he said, make me a home so that I can dwell among you, so that I can be with you. Amen? Mm -hmm. And it started out as a tabernacle, a tent. Mm -hmm. Later it became a temple. And you can read all about God's preferences for furniture, for the size of the rooms, the way the priests were supposed to dress, even the way they were supposed to smell. I mean, that's getting pretty weird. You know, I mean, to me, that's kind of bizarre, but it's all there at Exodus between Exodus 25 through Exodus 40. All of this information is there that God was commanding or demanding for his presence to dwell. And so when you first read it, it is weird. It's 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 kind of bizarre. Why was God so particular? Because it's revealing him. It's revealing Jesus. That's why he wanted it a specific way, a certain size, a certain type of materials. And and all of those things were pointing to him, a revelation of him, for us to have a clearer understanding of him, for us to know him better, to be able to be intimate with him. Amen? 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. Now this is after Solomon has built the temple. 
and this is the first time they're going in and they, they built God's dwelling place, right? And they're going to go in and worship, right? And now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. They got a revelation all of a sudden because of God's presence and his manifesting, amen, of his glory. Amen. So uh, this became God's home. This became his address on earth. He was close. He was nearby. And you notice that when God was close, so was his glory. So was his blessing. Amen? When his presence left, so did the glory. So did the blessing. See, God's ambition is that we might live in his presence. In the glory. In the blessing. Amen? Now, this is insane, but the truth is, Israel rejected the offer. I mean, looking, hindsight's always 2020, but when you look at it now, you think, what in the name of God were they thinking? He was trying to give them everything, and they just said, no thanks. But God is determined. Praise the Lord. John 1, 14. I know this in my own personal life, so... You know, it's true for a, as, a, as a church, but we are all individual church, yeah. you know, the dwelling place. Yeah. So the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, yes. and we beheld his glory. Praise the Lord. Yes. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God just moved back into the neighborhood. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. He hadn't changed his plan. Somebody rejects me, I'll find somebody else. Yeah. And he comes in the person of Jesus. And because we've read this thing so many times, it's easy to miss the magnitude of what John said. The presence that dwelled in the tabernacle, that dwelt in the temple, was born of a virgin and literally lived among normal people like us. Praise God. The walking, stumbling, filthy, Sweaty, hungry, bathing, eating, holy of holies. That's us. When God was present, so was his blessing. John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He didn't say, I give life. He didn't say, I point the way. But he said, I am the life. I am the way. Praise the Lord. Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew 28, 20. He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And it was the cross that made that possible. He said on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or why have you departed from me? He took on our sin, and as a result, he was cut off or he was separated from the Father for a moment in eternity so that for all of eternity we never will be. Right. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Romans 8, 1. Yes. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Look, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And that who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And I've got the original 
reprints. I don't have the originals, obviously. But I've got the reprinting of the original Greek. And that isn't even in it. After the comma behind Jesus, who walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit isn't there. What he actually was saying was, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in union with Christ. Jesus. Praise the Lord. That would be anybody who is born again. Yes. Yes. See, Jesus experienced this momentary darkness or separation so that we would know the eternal light of God's presence forever. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, distinguishable from the other people, right? That you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness yes. into his marvelous light, yes. which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Yes. Praise God. Adam and Eve went into hiding. But on the cross, Jesus found us. So we don't ever have to hide again. So many people that are saved, that know the Lord, that have confessed him as their Savior, are living tortured lives. Living almost as though they were not saved. And it's only because they think God's mad at them. They think, I've, I've, I've screwed up too big. And this is what God's trying to tell them. There's no way you can do it. You don't have to hide from me anymore. You don't have to hide behind your issues and your mess. and You don't have to worry about it. Just come boldly to the throne of grace. Because that's what I've wanted all along, is intimacy with you. Relationship with you. You don't have to be afraid that I'm going to punish you or that I'm going to do damage to you. The problem is we do stupid things and then the consequences come back and we think it was God because of religion. We think it's some kind of judgment from God because this bad thing happened or this situation. No, it, it was a poor choice. But God still wants you to come back to him because the only way he can fix that is by your being in his presence, by being a part of what he wants for you. Praise the Lord. And all of this leaves us with a question. How is he present with us now? John 14, verses 16 and 17. Thank you, Jesus. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Remember, Jesus said, I am the truth. This is the spirit of Christ, amen? Whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him because he dwells with you and shall be in you. So the world, what distinguishes us, the world doesn't know it. They don't know him. They don't have this, right? But we're distinguished by the fact that we do and we are. Right. Praise the Lord. That ought to stagger us. Yeah. And we get so used to scriptures and repeating. I mean, this is all simple stuff that I'm telling you this morning. It isn't like something you didn't know, right? Right. And we've all gone through this. But we we have a tendency to do what I was doing when I was talking to the Lord, and that is just kind of drifting, you know, to a place where you're trying to be what God wants you to be, but you're you're trying too hard. When all he wants is you. He doesn't want your work. He doesn't want your effort. He just wants you. Praise the Lord. I don't want my kids to come over because I want them to mow the yard or I want them to cut down a tree or they, you know, I want them to come because they just want to be with me. Yeah. Right? I mean, isn't that what we all want? And, and, yeah. and the truth is they want the same thing. They don't want us to come just so we can correct them or, you know, fix their mess. They want us to come because we love them. Yeah. They want to be loved. They want to feel that even when they're in the middle of their mess. Yeah. In fact, even more so when they're in the mess. 
Praise the Lord. It ought to stagger us because I'll tell you what, Paul couldn't get over it. He came from a very religious background. We all know this, but it, it just dumbfounded him. He could not get past this miraculous thing that God was doing, that it was about God's love and not about God's requirements. The mystery that had been hidden for ages and generations. Moses said, your presence has to be with me. Show me your glory. And this will be the last scripture. Colossians 1, verse 26 and 27. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, if, we, if, our, if somehow we could stay focused on this, on this reality, yes. things would, would definitely be different. Yes. He's always with me. He's never going to leave me. Right. This is this mystery that the world doesn't know. Hasn't been revealed that it's Christ in us. It's what distinguishes us from them. Not that we're better. Not that we're brighter. Not that we dress different or we look different. It's that Christ is in us and not in them. Praise the Lord. They may not know what it is, but once they kind of get around you a little bit, they'll either want to embrace it or they'll want to dodge you every time they see you. It doesn't mean that you're being weird. It just means they can distinguish there's something different. different. That's right. There's a distinguishing thing about you that they cannot maybe put their finger on. They just know they make me uncomfortable, yeah. right? Or they, they're just different or whatever it might be. Amen? So the secret's not that Christ is beside me. It's not Christ beside you. It's not Christ near you. Mm-hmm. It's Christ in you. Yeah. And the key to supernatural power is understanding that power is in the presence. And his presence is in you. You cannot move in this life as a believer and not have power. Amen. The problem has been, I think for the most part, is our lack of acknowledging he's in me. And the power doesn't flow unless... I'm aware of the presence. And he, he uses scripture after scripture after scripture to tell us, I'm with you. Yes. I'm not leaving you. That's you can't right. screw this up. That's right. You cannot screw it up to the point where I will leave you. I'll always be. I'll never yes. leave you or forsake you. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the earth. Therefore, the power is always with you. When you're aware yep. of the presence, the power is naturally there. It's just an outflow of that presence. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Give the Lord a hand clap. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. We don't need to make it about religious stuff. It's just about being conscious that he's always with me. Yep. Amen. In the past, it's been if I'm, if I'm aware of his presence, then I've got to be careful. That's hiding. Yeah. No. You just need to be aware of his presence no matter what the situation is you're in or whatever choice you have made or or whatever screw-up you've had. He's still with you. He will not leave you. The power is still there to overcome whatever the situation is if you will focus on that reality of his presence. The power is in the presence. Amen. Praise the Lord. I mean, I understand, Moses. If you're not with me, I ain't moving. If I'm not aware, if I'm not conscious of your presence, amen, then I'm not distinguished from anybody else in this world. I'm just like everybody else. But when I know that your word is true, that you're faithful to your word, that you'll never leave me or forsake me, I'm walking in the power of Almighty God every place I go with whoever I'm with in any circumstance and under any any situation. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. He answered that for Moses in us. Praise the Lord. Give him one more hand clap. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. I love you all. I told you. Praise the Lord.
first in line at the buffet. Glory to God. It's a gift. Hallelujah from the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless all of you for being here. Have a great week. Remember.